Alrighty, uh, question on emotion here. So, uh, getting right into this, we're looking at the claims emotions are feelings. Okay. B, there are no criteria of emotional evaluation. Hopefully, you can see that Nozick denies both of those claims. And that on his account of emotion, both of those claims turn out to be false. Right? Emotions aren't just feelings, on his view. And there are principles of evaluation for emotions. That's where we get in the fitting and unfitting emotion. So I'm asking you here, basically, um, how does he support the denial of A and B? So um, for A, that should have you explaining the pride example at the beginning of the chapter as a way of denying A. So just take the pride discussion and use that as the reason for denying A. It might be a reason for lots of other things too, but Nozick is clearly aiming to defend this more kind of cognitive view of emotion that he introduces, you know, saying there's a number of people that seem to buy into this general view, and he's siding with them against a kind of rival theory of emotion, which does say that emotions are just feeling states. There's actually a very famous uh, research program on emotion, one of the earliest ones by Paul Ekman, called the Affect Program, A-F-F-E-C-T, Affect Program. And that's where the idea of the basic emotions come from, Ekman's uh, pioneering work at UC Berkeley. And that specifically argues that emotions are kind of subcognitive enough that um, really they're like just feeling states of people. Uh, and we find that there are some like cross-culturally universal emotion types. Um, so there, there is a real view out there that says emotions are just feelings or that that's the affect view. The rival view is basically, you know, Nozick's on board for that. So the pride example is supposed to show that A is false. So exactly how, it takes a little, you know, a little doing to see that. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in the review session. Um, basically, let's put it out like this. If pride were just a feeling, then in these little pride stories that he tells at the beginning of the chapter, we really shouldn't have the reaction that we do have. I'll leave you to kind of look at that part of the chapter. The whole narrative is like, well, don't we react to these cases as follows? Da -da 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 -da. So we would only have those kinds of reactions if we denied A. If we believed that pride is just a feeling, then we wouldn't really have those kinds of reactions that he describes in the early part of the chapter, the pride things. Yeah. So that's at least how he's trying to use it as an argument against A. Now, for the argument against B, basically it's straightforward. Given the argument for A, I'm sorry, given the argument against A, because emotions turn out to be beliefs, evaluations, and feelings, that entails the falsity of B. So the, the view of emotion that Nozick defends in place of the affect view is that belief, evaluation, feeling account of emotion. Given that account of emotion, we can see that B is false because we get these clear ways in which emotions can be fitting or unfitting, namely because their belief evaluation can be true or false. The evaluation component, as he says, can be correct or incorrect, and the feeling component can be either uh, proportionate or not proportionate. And that's proportionate to the value or the, the evaluation element. So uh, that seems to just follow straightforwardly from the very thing that showed A to be false also shows B to be false. So here we can see this you know, view of belief, evaluation, feeling is doing some pretty significant philosophical work. You know, it's not just a vision of what an emotion is. Um, it's 
got some kind of philosophical teeth in refuting certain views of emotion that are out there. And that's one reason we can say to kind of learn something about emotion through his account. You know, not just getting a definition of it, but we can see how it's kind of connected to other things that we say and think about our emotional life. So it might aid our kind of overall understanding of emotion in that way. So that's all, um, you know, you presenting Nozick's definitions uh, his definition of um, of emotion as a way of arguing against these other conceptions of emotion that are out there. So, and so along the way, certainly comment on if you are finding his arguments plausible or not. I guess I find them pretty plausible, to be honest. Um, and you know, you might note like, well, what else is kind of like a selling point of the belief, evaluation, feeling, conception of emotion? Now that we've kind of like seen it at work and kind of, you know, seeing how it argues against these other views and just kinds of like philosophical dialectics, which is important. But, you know, what else is there that we might say about it? So, I mean, for one example, what I think is kind of interesting about it is that I think even more than the affect view, the belief evaluation feeling view, people usually call it the cognitive view of emotion or judgment view. Um, kind of explains the way in which emotions are like rich person states because they really contain, a, a, in some cases, wide range of your beliefs about the world and your values. So there's kind of a lot of you in emotion states the way Nozick defines them, exactly because they have your beliefs and evaluations in them. So that seems to fit kind of how we think of emotions. They're kind of like personally rich, deep states. And I think Nozick's view gives a decent explanation as to why. You know, in a way that we can explain the depth that they've got. It, it comes in not just the feeling, but because that feeling is imbued with and kind of filtered through our beliefs and evaluations. There's more of us in that state then, if we had the just emotions or feelings view, which has us with the feeling, but not the other stuff. Okay, so that's just an example of something that kind of seems like a selling point for Nozick's view. That's not quite right in the mix of how it argues against A and B here. So you can kind of, it's a kind of thing you can add on your way out, so to speak. Moving to the next point, how would you respond to this question? Would I be better off without emotions? That's basically just a version of the Spock problem that he's got like midway through the chapter or so, and he spends a good amount of time going over the Spock problem. And the point of that thought experiment there is really not to question the value of emotions, but or like whether they have any value, but really as a kind of indirect way to getting us to be able to very precisely state what value they've got in our life by imagining this case where everything else is just like it is now in your life, let's say, but we just took out the emotional experiences and then were the emotional reactions. Let's put it that way. So you do all the same kind of stuff, you look the same way, da da da, da. so you have the same major, da da. da. And you can think. You, know, you still have consciousness, and you can think. And this is important. You can have non-emotional feelings. That's something that comes out of his definition of emotion, is that we can separate emotional feelings, which are the ones connected to our beliefs and values, from non-emotional feelings, which just don't have that essential connection to what we think about the world and to our cognitive life like a tickle or an itch. People usually kind of use those examples. Raw pains and pleasures are feelings that aren't emotional feelings. So you imagine a life where you have all that, but you just don't have any emotions that come along with it. So when we just take out the emotions, what valuable things go with it? That's a way of identifying 
what valuable things are present in the life of people like ourselves that have emotions. So now we kind of know what emotions bring to life. In particular, what of value they bring to life. It's that exact thing that we're missing when we look at the Spock version of ourself or when we address this Spock problem. So the thing that the value is exactly whatever it is that's missing. So the question here is like, well, what's, what goes when you've got emotion? What can't we do anymore? This is a way of kind of like being like existentially disabled or you know, something's worse. If it's not, then hey, maybe we would, we would be better off without emotions. So you're welcome to go that way. I mean, um, it gets a little you know, hard to really say why we would be worse off without emotions when you add that, well, you wouldn't have any emotional suffering that comes from your lack of emotions, right? Because that would require having emotions. So, well, that's a lot of suffering that you won't have. And, you know, all of the troubles that come from our emotions are things that we won't have anymore. I wonder if that would make less violence if we had less emotions like anger and jealousy and pride, all that kind of stuff. Is that what creates war and hatred and violence? Um, maybe it isn't. Maybe that actually tempers the inclination to pursue your rational self-interest, that a purely rational creature would do even more if they weren't kind of mm, tempered by emotions of compassion, love, empathy, things like that. So I don't know if there would be more violence or less violence in a world where people didn't have emotions. But those are the kinds of things to think about here. And you know, what do you say? So this really is a way of kind of like getting to what you would think is the value that emotion brings to life. Okay, so the more specific, the better, you know. Um, it's, you know, kind of a truism to just say, well, emotions are valuable, and, like, they're good, and, like, you know, they bring things to life. But, you know, exactly what? And specifically, like, what does the emotion bring to life that rationality doesn't? You know, maybe there's... A lot of the good things in life are things that are the rational mind brings to life more so than emotion. But at some point, there's probably something that emotion alone and only emotion brings to our life that the rational mind couldn't reproduce. That's the kind of thing that we're looking at here. It's kind of unique value that emotion brings to life. All right, so that's pretty much it. And, you know, you can kind of wrap it up um, how you see fit. And um, there you go.